This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Now, I know I say this almost every week, but there has been a ridiculous amount of information to cover. We have Starship SN10, of course. We won't forget that, but we also had an incredible announcement by Rocket Lab during the week. A super optimistic update from the Dear Moon project aiming to send the first civilian lunar mission to fly out past the moon further than any human has traveled by 2023. And to top all of that off, a few interesting updates with Starship. Starlink. So yeah, it has been a long week with the anticipation of Starship Serial Number 10's flight. As always though, Boga Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight didn't miss a thing. Thanks Mary for the incredible continued coverage. Very early in the week we could see that the flight termination system had already been installed. You can see these two white boxes here which trigger explosions in a controlled manner if Starship ends up in a situation where it is drastically off course or has a failure that stops a landing from being possible. This termination system was a great indicator that SpaceX were gearing up for an imminent flight attempt. The fresh paint on the landing pad there was also applied with that SpaceX logo just recently. This is the bullseye ladies and gentlemen and of course that flight for Monday was cancelled due to weather and a new date was set for Wednesday the 3rd. That nervous wait continued but sure enough approvals were A-OK. -okay. The weather was looking great so the countdown was on. So yes, after a couple of weeks of delays due to weather, a Raptor swap and a Raptor issue causing a first attempt abort, SN10 finally took to the sky and underwent a flawless launch and skydive as well as a reasonable sort of landing. SN10's goal this time was of course to match the success of SN8 and SN9's flight with the ultimate prize of course being a smooth touchdown on the landing pad. SN10 of course as we saw didn't have the smoothest of landings like we may have wanted, but it surely did set itself on the ground and stayed there. Well, for a few minutes at least before it went, of course, on its second hop on its own terms. Yeah, a little bit nasty. So yes, the first attempt came at 2.14pm, however an autobot was called right at ignition. That was due to a slightly conservative high thrust limit with one of the engines. SpaceX's plan to mitigate this issue was to increase the thrust limit for another flight attempt around two hours later as tweeted here by Elon Musk. Then at 5.14pm on Wednesday afternoon, history was finally made. Here we see the ignition and that gigantic plume of exhaust and dust. SN 10 gracefully lifted off the launch stand and rode that pillar of fire with those three Raptor engines flawlessly hurling the vessel into the Texas sky. As Starship ascended, one engine was shut down, followed soon by the second. That was of course normal and done to reduce the overall thrust to weight ratio as the tanks emptied out, just like with SN8 and 9. Now once it reached its maximum altitude of 10 kilometers, which is a little over 6 miles or so, it hovered for a short time completing a tank handoff where the Raptor engine's source of propellant was transferred from the main tanks to the header tanks ready for that flip maneuver. At 4 minutes and 20 seconds the reaction control system started firing and aero surfaces started maneuvering into position to transition the vehicle into that horizontal skydive position to complete the subsonic portion of the flight. The aft and forward flaps are then used to hold the vehicle's stability for a controlled descent back to the landing site. Now this was the moment where the entire community was under an immense amount of nerves hoping for that successful landing after those past two explosions. And there it was as Starship approached the landing pad all three Raptors fired up successfully with all of them firing through that tail flip. After the initial tail down maneuver was complete two Raptors shut off in quick succession and the vehicle continued down under a single engine for the final descent. So this was the main difference from other landing attempts as previously they only ignited two engines instead of all three. It sure looked similar to SN5 and SN6's 150 meter test hops but what we saw was history here being made with SN10's touchdown. Those six tiny legs popped out although it seemed like only three fully locked into position. SN10 completed a harder than expected landing near the center of the land 
landing pad right next to that freshly painted logo. This was another moment that will go down in history. Multiple prototypes and test tanks have brought us to the point where we are right now, where we can see a Starship vehicle there standing on its own after flying to 10 kilometers, belly flopping back to the landing site where it then flipped back to vertical and touched down successfully. Although SN10 may have exploded a few minutes later after its landing, it was a massive achievement to even attempt to fly a vehicle this big and then try to recover it in this way. A truly remarkable event this was, and it has been inspiring to watch SpaceX iterate for the past year. So yes, with all of that, in the meantime, the large dome structure here, which we are assuming is still for the orbital launch site tank farm, was moved to the old gas well site. We haven't seen any confirmation on the potential future tank, but it is now fairly well publicized that the site here will have three tanks to fuel the orbital starship and super heavy. A big thank you yet again for another amazing flight by RGV Aerial Photography capturing all these scenes from above. To support that work, the link there to Patreon helps Mauricio a huge amount, and these are the views that we get. The launch mount we have right here, and not a lot seems to have happened to the lower pillar section for the past few weeks. However, the platform that will sit above has been constructed very rapidly, and here we can see the full circumference of that table was placed and was being worked on throughout the week. If we zoom in here you can really get to see the thickness in this steel. Keep in mind that this table needs to support the weight of a loaded Super Heavy and Starship stack at around 5,000 metric tons. That is a crazy amount of mass to support. To compare for a second, the Saturn V was somewhere in the vicinity of 2,900 metric tons. Just imagine being anywhere near the full Super Heavy as it launches. The power needed to lift 5,000 metric tons will absolutely blow people's minds. Now we'll head over to the construction yard to catch up on some updates there. What you're seeing here is an accurate model of the distance between the two sites. They roll Starship prototypes all the way down the road to the launch stand. We'll hopefully see SN11 rolling down here very soon. We actually did a more in-depth breakdown of the full construction site and the process that they go through to build the Starship prototypes in last weekend's video. Thanks a heap everyone for the terrific feedback on that segment. A very nice jump in subscribers and likes after that and yes, getting really Real close now to that goal of hitting 300,000 subscribers. All of your interactivity made a huge difference to me there, so thank you for helping me out. You guys are just amazing. Now, we talked last week about SpaceX dismantling Starship Serial No. 5, which was the first full-scale Starship to take flight, excluding, of course, that nose cone. The destruction of this vessel continued this week, and here we see the aft section being moved to the scrapyard to finalize that job. It's still a little sad to see the end of that awesome groundbreaker, but hey, you just can't hold onto all these prototypes, otherwise there would be no room left, I guess. SpaceX has been awarded an $8.5 million contract for developing multi-purpose thermal protection systems for hypersonic purposes, as shared here by Steve. If SpaceX can develop low-cost, high-production tiles here, that will be a beneficial application for many future purposes. We also saw another Raptor spotted in the wild this week. This is Raptor engine serial number 47, which was delivered to the site on Monday. And at this point, I think we can very safely assume that SpaceX are just full on trolling us at this point. We can see in this shot here saying, when hop, much wow. And an expertly drawn picture there of Thunder Chicken. Someone on the Raptor delivery team is having a heck of a lot of fun there. I mean, you've just got to appreciate that at least the team at the sites are in bracing the cameras peering into the facility. As they say, there is no publicity like free publicity, and yep, I guess I'm included providing a tiny slice of that. Now, speaking of the Raptor engine, I've just got to shout out the work here by Alexander Span. And I must admit, when I first looked at this, I immediately assumed it was a real photo. Just look closer though. Yep, this is a 3D model with incredibly detailed textures. Alexander here came out of nowhere around a week ago and dropped this here on Twitter for the world to see. He has been working on this Raptor engine model for around 120 days and just decided that it was ready to present. Can you believe this? I mean, if you are not already following him there, 
there on Twitter, you are going to miss out on many great images and wallpapers to come. Just check out this glass version. This really illustrates the detail Alex has gone into here. Every pipe, nut and connector has been modelled accurately from these real life shots that get continually provided by the community. Absolutely freaking incredible. Thanks so much Alex for this huge effort. Seriously, this is world class stuff. Now, the announcements kept on coming thick and fast this week, with this video dropping on Tuesday with Yazaku Maezawa releasing an update for the Dear Moon mission. We haven't really heard much at all about this project for around two years, but that has just changed. This will be the first civilian lunar mission to fly out past the moon, and as stated in the video, will proceed out past the moon to such an extent that it will actually be the furthest that humans have ever traveled, period. That is planned for 20 2023, utilizing SpaceX's Starship, which made quite the reaction on Twitter from the usual massive fanfare with any such announcement, along with a healthy dose of skepticism on that time frame. Can SpaceX develop the Starship system, including passing the human rating requirements, and get orbital refilling systems working before that time? I think it is going to be extremely tight myself, and it's an incredibly ambitious time frame, but every week we see astounding progress, so you let me know what you think in the comments place your bets. As it stands right now, they are in the pre-registration process and are looking for eight crew members for the journey itself. Along with this, a bunch of new renders of Starship were added to the Dear Moon website. Now, this design here on the windows and nose is something that we haven't seen before. I'm not sure if these images are produced from SpaceX or more are just artist impressions, but that looks pretty darn cool all the same. It has a more restricted size and design, however, we kind of expect this to happen as those massive windows certainly add extra complexity and weight to the vehicle overall. On top of this, we had a massive Rocket Lab announcement this week, which arrived in a quite nonchalant way with them releasing a video on their Twitter and YouTube. Peter Beck here, the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab, announced in this short four and a half minute video their new rocket, the Neutron. However, the build up to this actual announcement was arguably the most exciting part of the entire video. We saw a brief history of their commitments to build an orbital vehicle and how they got along with their current state of the art manufacturing and 3D printing of the Rutherford engine. It also included their accomplishments in being the first privately operated launch site in the world, the first carbon fiber composite vehicle into space, and the first electric pump-fed rocket engine into orbit. These are all massive hallmarks for Rocket Lab alone, but that was not all that Peter Beck had left to announce. Right before his true announcement about Neutron, he had to finish his last piece of business by eating a hat. Yep, that's right. Right, he ate a hat. In the past, Peter Beck had said that he would do this if they decided to go reusable, which they did in this past November with their return to send a mission, or of course if Rocket Lab ever went public on the stock market, which they also did at the same time of this announcement. So yes, Peter is a man of his word, and he went on to seemingly finish off his video by slicing up a hat, putting it in a blender, and then eating it. Saying that by the look on his face, he certainly didn't seem to be enjoying it. I'm I'm sure he was happy to satisfy us fans by giving us all what we wanted. So yes, thank you, Peter Beck. Now, just as we thought the video was over, the camera zoomed out, up he got and announced the Neutron. I can't believe he just sat there and was eating a hat within Neutron's payload fairing the entire time. So a major note about Neutron is that it'll be capable of human space flight, which really widens their options to providing access into low Earth orbit and also to space stations like the up and coming Axiom station. But back to the vehicle itself, it'll be able to launch 8 tons into orbit and will be fully reusable using a Falcon 9 like first stage landing on an autonomous ocean vessel. In that regard, we saw then Elon replying to an image of Neutron by saying it looks quite familiar. Nonetheless, the right move. Congrats to Rocket Lab. I just find that this level of camaraderie between the space community is extremely healthy and especially enhances the partnerships and understanding during failures and also great successes. As Neutron stance currently, it likely will be made of a metal alloy of some sort that run off highly refined kerosene or RP1 along with liquid oxygen. 
This vessel will be capable of launching many satellites into orbit at once with its huge 4.5 metre fairing for massive mega constellations. So yes, after Peter ate a hat here and held up his promises, what else do you think is in store for Rocket Lab's future? Now that they are getting into a medium lift market, do you think that there will be major changes to their operation with Electron? Let me know in the comments below. Now it was time once again for another Starlink launch and due to bad weather in the recovery area earlier in the week, the launch was postponed. Finally, the opportunity to launch opened on March 4th. From pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, the 20th Starlink launch was well underway. The Falcon 9 booster for this flight became the second in the fleet to fly for an eighth time. The launch went perfectly as well with the uphill climb looking great as always and the extra telemetry readings provided great insight into the velocity and progress of the flight. We saw the main engine cutoff and second stage separation with the payload heading for its target orbit. Interestingly though, unlike launches before, this one had no video coverage of the boost back burn or entry burn and descent to the drone ship. Even though we didn't see it, we had there the landing on the autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, and this marked the 75th successful booster recovery. So yes, the Starlink constellation has been growing steadily over the last year, and an update dropped here by Elias shows the most recent Starlink constellation update. Now each of these spots that you can see here is a Starlink satellite being tracked, and what is most interesting is that we see all the orbital planes here appearing stationary with the majority locked in their defined orbit until right here. Now, from December 2020 onwards, we see SpaceX begin to redistribute most of the satellite network by reducing their altitude by around 2.5 kilometers relative to what was thought to be their operational altitude in the past. That kind of throws out the animation here for the moment until it can be updated, but this is quite interesting. Now, this is all because SpaceX did announce that the team had begun repositioning more than 500 satellites in an effort to improve coverage and decrease outages back at the end of December, with the final result expected to substantially improve user experience in this current quarter of 2021. So yes, it's just incredible to see this so clearly reflected by the animation here. Make sure you're following Elias there to keep up to date with this information too. All of the data used to process this is drawn right from spacetrack.org, so it is super accurate information. If you want to understand more about how this is all plotted, check out the link to the full video in the description. Remember as well that the Star network, even though it contains a huge number of satellites, is designed in such a way and in a low enough orbit that the majority of risk with any sort of runaway space junk issue is mitigated quite well. The satellites themselves will naturally decay quite quickly and burn up cleanly as they re-enter Earth's atmosphere. That doesn't mean to say though that we shouldn't be cautious, and all of this actually ties in beautifully with our incredible sponsor for today's episode, Curiosity Stream. This is a subscription streaming service that I've been subscribed to myself for years. It provides thousands of award-winning documentaries, including a huge library of space-related content such as this one here about space junk dangers as part of the Breakthrough series. Now, if you remember back in March of 2019, you will recall a ballistic missile test conducted by India shooting down one of its own communication satellites, which caused a load of space debris and, of course, was a big concern around the world. Likewise, other countries have done anti-satellite tests in the past, and these set a very dangerous precedent for the future use of space. If you want to get some new perspective on this critical problem and how we can control it in the future, this is a great episode to watch. I've loved so many of the documentaries and series offered here, and it isn't just space-related content that is available. Perhaps you're also interested in other science and technology-related topics. It could be nature, food, travel, or history. There are many great libraries here for you to explore, and you can even stream this incredible content worldwide any time on a range of supported devices. If you would like to help support me and you'd like to check it out, give it a try by heading to curiositystream.com slash Marcus House. With that, you can sign up for access at just $14.99 for the entire year. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, just keep in mind that Starlink does have very sophisticated software controlling the satellites themselves. These also crunch data to detect and mitigate potential collision events. That capability reduces any human error and allows for a more reliable approach to collision avoidance. Of course, at the end of the satellite lifetime in a normal operational situation, the plan is to have them deorbit over the course of a few months using that last bit of remaining fuel. SpaceX have always claimed so far that they are on the leading edge of debris mitigation 
regulation exceeding all regulatory and industry standards. That is certainly important and Starlink at the same time will change the world for so many that need high speed internet. SpaceX are leading the way here. So yes, in signing off, remember that we are huge supporters of the transition to electric vehicles on the channel here and our partner EV offers the ability to hire an electric vehicle in Australia. Perhaps you have wanted to take an extended test drive. You could be touring the country and want to drive around in a Tesla. If that sounds appealing to you, you can use the link in the description for a discount. Huge thank you as well to the amazing patrons and YouTube members here. There is no way that we can continue creating content at this frequency and length without all of you. The support that you are all providing here allows us to increase the time that we can spend and that is all thanks to that growing list that we see right there. Thank you to each and every one of you. As support increases, that helps the entire team here. So if you like what we're doing and you'd like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House or alternatively now you can join up as a YouTube member below. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can also have your names listed right there like all these other amazing people. You can also have earlier and ad-free access to these videos to watch before anyone else. Huge thank you especially to the production crew assisting greatly with video production and of course to the quality control squad here for helping me research and proof all of the material that we have for these videos. If you are interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of it, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week with a more in-depth breakdown of the full construction site and the process that they go through here at SpaceX to build the Starship prototypes. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.